The most famous supernatural account in the First World War is the story of the Angels of Mons. In this legend, guardian angels descended from heaven to protect members of the British Army at a crucial point, altering the course of conflict. In September, popular author and Golden Dawn initiate Arthur Mackin published his story, The Bowmen, based on accounts of the battle he had read in newspapers, with one important addition. St. George appeared alongside phantom longbowmen from Agincourt, thwarting the German military and saving the British troops. In the ensuing months, accounts began to circulate in Britain, claiming that phantom cavalrymen and indeed longbowmen had appeared, and that they had protected British troops. Mackin's account had become a reality, and he speculated that his story had turned into the Angels of Mons. In no time, it was unpatriotic, almost treasonable to doubt this story. Prominent churchmen, such as Anglican writer and journalist Harold Begbie, attacked Mackin in a booklet titled On the Side of the Angels, in which he attempted to prove that the angel accounts were not traceable to Mackin's fiction. Fiction, the supernatural, politics, and war had merged into a fabulous, galvanizing myth, and the account of angels appearing to aid British troops established a special atmosphere that persisted for the remainder of the war. The British fought on the side of good. God was on their side. And this fact was confirmed by a supernatural event, a miracle. An investigation conducted by the Society for Psychical Research in 1915 led to the conclusion that the bulk of the stories were unfounded. However, they stated that, quote, a certain number of men who took part in the retreat from Mons honestly believed themselves to have had at that time supernatural experiences of a remarkable character, end quote. That a society purporting to believe in spirits seemingly discredited such rumors has led recent writers, for example, David Clark, to suggest that the legend of Angels of Mons may have been a coordinated effort by the British military intelligence to boost morale through propaganda that, quote, appealed to a deep well of belief and tradition invoked in times of national crisis, end quote. Clark's claim raises significantly the stakes for the connection between national politics, cloak and dagger activities, and esoteric societies. Egil Asprem and Asbjorn de Rendal have pointed out that esotericism and conspiracy theory are joined at the hip. But if we look to historians who do not commonly incorporate a history of esotericism into their analysis, such as Timothy Melly and Catherine Olmsted, we find accounts in which covert military operations and conspiracy theory are joined at the hip. The present essay is an attempt to make a small intervention into the important work being done on esotericism and conspiracism by factoring in connections between historical actors we think of as esotericists and the aggressive war-related actions of national governments, including the covert sphere of military intelligence. De Rendal has also attempted to consider conspiracy theorizing as a form of esoteric discourse. In the rhetoric of esoteric groups during the First World War, it is possible to observe how esotericism functions as, in de Rendal's phrasing, quote, mythologies of evil, revealing secret knowledge about the origins and nature of evils befalling humanity and nature, end quote. Knowledge of the secret machinations beyond the veil of the mainstream narrative, as it is so often referred to today, grants a special Gnostic awareness and a certain intellectual prowess. I do not approach this subject in order to demonize or condemn, but to understand and connect to our present crisis. Looking back, what is important is not only what is right or wrong, rather, the publications, lectures, letters, and events of this period offer us a window into the past, a window through which we find our contemporary socio-political climate gazing back at us. Knowing what esotericists feared, decried, and advocated during the war enables us to gain a more objective view of how social processes that involve conspiracism, esotericism, and nationalism are mutually constitutive. I employ the word crisis here deliberately. Circumstances surrounding the First World War represented a crisis, and it is possible to believe that we find ourselves in a similar yet not identical situation today. Reinhard Koselleck, often considered the founder of conceptual history, 
analyzed the sociopolitical role and function of the concept of crisis in his well-known dissertation and 1959 book, Critique and Crisis. In this book, Kosselek argues that the European Enlightenment witnessed the emergence of a philosophy of history, politics, and morality that was deliberately operationalized to subvert theology, the older order, and the church. The word crisis, in this sense, was given new conceptual meaning that was oriented toward ushering in a new and, in Kosselek's analysis, specifically utopian society, i.e. the modern West. Kosselek returned to the concept in the early 1980s to pen its entry in the Geschichtliche Grundbegriffe. This time, Kosselek traced the usage and application of the concept to three prim primary domains of knowledge, law, medicine, and theology. In the ancient Mediterranean, significant importance was placed on choosing a side and making a decision whenever crisis was evoked. The Greek word for crisis derives from the verb to judge, separate, or decide. It also means to quarrel or to fight. In judicial proceedings, the word was used in terms of making a judgment or verdict. The concept, therefore, presupposed a for or against. This meaning was applied in the early theology of the Septuagint and the four Greek Gospels, wherein the crisis indicated an end times or apocalypse, a final historical event precipitating a final judgment. Here, Kosselik finds a new dimension added to the concept, namely the idea of a realizable utopic future predicated on judgment or taking of sides. The word was carried over into Latin possessing this new addition. And finally, Kosselik describes how Galen's Corpus Hippocraticum introduced the concept of crisis as a medical theory. In Galen's medical system, crisis referred both to the observable condition and to the judgment about the course of the illness. This meant the stage of the illness and the prediction of its course, as well as the recovery or relapse of the patient, was indicated by the concept of crisis. This medicalized use of the word started in the 1700s to be applied to the body politic, or to constituent parts of society. Kosselik's highlighting of the implicit decision-making aspect of crisis is significant for gaining a deeper understanding of the nationalist tendencies of esotericists during the First World War. This period was represented in terms of crisis, especially during the month-long period following the assassination of Archduke Franz Ferdinand until the declaration of war, which became known as the July Crisis. When the war situation developed, governmental bodies and the representative medias urged citizens to take a stand, make a decision, inevitably the choice to support the war. In the October 1915 edition of the Theosophical Quarterly, the following paragraph appeared in a short piece entitled The Lodge and the War. Quote, the lines are set. The battle is on between the White Lodge and the Black. Among the nations, there are those that, through inherent arrogance, vanity, foulness, have yielded themselves up exultantly to the black powers, who will use them only to betray them. Among the nations, there are those who, from inherent loyalty, love of honor, and of justice, and of the purer essence of liberty, by the fire of their devotion and their power of sacrifice, have made it possible for the White Lodge to make them its instruments. The results to both will be momentous and will change the face of all future time. End quote. This inspired passage characterized a crucial aspect of the First World War that was generally accepted by most occultists and esotericists of the time, namely that this war was a spiritual one, directed by higher and lower spiritual beings and unfolding a long history of the Earth's karmic destiny, culminating in a new future time. While the word crisis is not evoked in the above paragraph, the elements described by Kosselek should be readily apparent. Exactly which nations are on the side of the black and white lodges is not yet specified. Other contemporary occultists were not so vague. A small booklet was published in London in 1915 entitled The War in a New Light, in which the author, Arthur Trefusis, presented the case that the Kaiser was the Antichrist. In this booklet, 
He attempts to uncover the karmic processes both national and individual behind current events. His discussion of the karma of nations is part of a larger discourse of occultists and theosophists who were endeavoring to integrate religious ideas from South and East Asia into their limited Western experience of the world, as they were now coming to realize. In the case of Trefusis, the karmic processes unfolding had to do with the incident that came to be known as the Rape of Belgium. Instead of placing blame on the Germans in any normal sense, Trefusis argued that these atrocities were the consequence for the innocent victims who had been murdered by King Leopold and his henchmen in the Belgium Congo. Congo. These souls were now reincarnating in Germany to enact retribution on Belgium as part of its national karma. The nature of the present generation of Germans, which had appeared as horrifically barbaric and brutish in the eyes of the rest of the world, was in fact the consequence of indwelling African souls hell-bent on exacting vengeance. An editorial review of Trefusis's book in the November 1915 edition of the Occult Review remarks, quote, This hypothesis, it seems to me, can scarcely be accepted unless we acknowledge the validity of a doctrine of national as well as individual karma. However unjust such a doctrine may appear, all history testifies to its validity. It was precisely this doctrine that operated in biblical times when the pestilence fell upon Israel for David's sin, and that David cried in vain to the prophet Nathan, As for these sheep, what have they done? End quote. Here the logic of a national karma opens the door to a consideration of unseen machinations that lay behind incomprehensible atrocities committed during war. The forces remain spiritual, and yet they intertwine with actual figures and historical events. Several years earlier, the then head of the Theosophical Society, Annie Besant, had written in her book, A Study in Karma, that the, quote, the rise and fall of nations are brought about by collective karma, end quote. A reader responds to the review of Trefusis's book, remarks, Quote, I should think the national German thought is enough to account for the birth into the nation of morally undeveloped souls. In peacetime, the civilian population of Germany commit frequent and appalling crimes of lust or assault, which meet often with comparatively slight legal punishment. The German spirit of savageness and cruelty seems to be too universal to be accounted for by reincarnated Congo inhabitants. End quote. However, the reader then recognizes that, quote, Miss Besant regards the war as a great quickener of national and individual karma preparing the way for a fairer civilization, end quote. In harshest terms, the resolving of national karma so that a future, more spiritual, fairer civilization could come into existence became contingent on the eradication of Germany. British occultists seemed eager to emphasize this as conflict grew worse. Renowned theosophist A.P. Sinnott saw the war representing a conflict that went all the way back to Atlantis. The evil of the Black Lodge had been confined to the astral plane, but the Germans had brought it down to the physical plane through their actions. Sinnott also believed a fairer civilization would emerge following the war, and that something he called, quote, collective compensation, end quote, would be obtained to recompense the world for the horrors through which it had passed, a phrase that eerily hints at the coming war reparations imposed on Germany following the war. Also in 1915, the U.S. Theosophical Society redefined its statement on universal brotherhood, claiming that war might, in fact, be necessary to obtain the goal of fraternity among all peoples and nations. The response to the introduction of this resolution from German theosophists was led by Secretary of the German branch, Paul Ratz, who, v who viewed the redefinition as an offensive error. When the annual convention of the United States Theosophical Society set to convene again in 1916, Ratz sent several letters stating that, quote, if we allow our hearts and minds to be drawn into the confusion of war, we leave the plane of reality, enter the plane of illusion, and violate hopelessly the principle of universal brotherhood. 
for then we are forced to take sides, to feel sympathy and love for one side, and antipathy and hate for the other, and to act accordingly." End quote. A senior theosophist named Cave responded to Ratz's letters proclaiming, quote, War is not an evil of itself. No, discipleship will not turn us into desiccated pansies. To some of us, this present war is one of the great crises in human evolution, when the most fundamental principles of righteousness are at stake. Nothing but the deepest damnation could await him who stood aside. The convention voted against rats and upheld the original resolution, albeit with minor alteration. The resolution reads, quote, The Theosophical Society in convention assembled hereby declares, A that war is not of necessity a violation of brotherhood, but may, on the contrary, become obligatory in obedience to the ideal of brotherhood, and b. that individual neutrality is wrong if it be believed that a principle of righteousness is at stake." End quote. An alternative resolution was submitted to be voted on during the 1916 convention by a delegate from the New York branch, which perhaps exposes part of the underlying motivation for the adoption of such a resolution. It reads, quote, It is the conviction of the convention that the powers of good are now ranged over against the powers of evil, that among the nations, France is leading the charge of the White Lodge against the attack of Germany, supported and directed by the Black Lodge and all the evil forces of the world, that this is a time when nations and individuals have chosen and must now choose to wage war both outward and inward, on one side or on the other. That this day of convention is the eleventh hour, and that choice must now be made. Furthermore, the society recognizes the fact that in this great conflict between good and evil, to, cho to choose neutrality is to choose hell." End quote. While the committee voted to postpone this resolution indefinitely, Many head theosophists in the room, if not all, stood up to lend their support. The stage had thus been set, and the choice to uphold the 1915 resolution fanned the flames of karmic rivalry. Anglo-American theosophists and occultists saw in the Great War the conspiracy of ancient spiritual wizards directing actions behind the scenes from the astral plane. German theosophists and occultists, on the other hand, began to perceive incarnated wizards as conspiring to coordinate their actions against Germany. While this type of occult work was actualized in the political, social, and military spheres, it was maintained that spirits of darkness or opposition were guiding these actions through the ritual occult work of secret and magical societies, especially Freemasons and Theosophists, two groups that frequently overlapped. One major German esotericist, Rudolf Steiner, told his audience in Stuttgart as early as September 1914 that the war was, quote, a conspiracy against German intellectual or mental life, end quote. What exactly did he mean? Situated within the Anglo-American theosophical context, a brief sketch of which was provided above, it is possible to see such remarks by Steiner as part of a developing international discourse within certain occult groups concerning the karmic processes involved in the war. This discourse taking place within the esoteric societies necessarily took the form of a type of conspiracism. Steiner carried the notion of a, con of a conspiracy against German intellectual life throughout the war, and his remarks have been highlighted by some scholars to signal a conspiratorial and nationalistic turn. Steiner's nationalism is complicated and remains understudied. For example, a month after his conspiracy statement, he gave another lecture in which he invited his audience to imagine the karmic consequences of a soldier who dies on the battlefield inflamed with rage and nationalistic sentiment. Quote, what does this national rage, this antipathy mean, he asks. It means the anticipation, and this nationality will be my next incarnation, end quote. In other words, the soldier, including his relatives, is destined to be reborn in that country he so detests, because, according to Steiner, quote, already in the subconscious, the higher self is connected with the other nationality, end quote. 
nationalistic antipathy, Steiner says, is, quote, the raging of humans against their higher self, end quote. In the previous lecture of September 1914, Steiner suggests to his audience that this war might be necessary and to trust in the spirit and think of those who are shedding blood as dying for a karmic purpose. Steiner explains, quote, Just in the week before the outbreak of the war, I had to read phrases in a newspaper such as the following. In spite of Leibknecht's rebuke, I find that in political life you do not need to tell the truth unless it comes out or harms you. This saying is marked by the materialism of our time, in which we would be suffocated without this war." End quote. The karmic connections to lying and untruthfulness among politicians and journalists became one of the central themes developed by Steiner over dozens of lectures during the war. Steiner envisioned the developments of the time as being orchestrated by secret societies and occult groups of Anglo-American countries to marginalize the intellectual mightiness of Germany so that English-speaking peoples could dominate through industrialization, scientific materialism, and capitalism. Interestingly, he thought that socialist experiments were being orchestrated in Russia by these Anglo-American secret groups to show these experiments as ultimately unsuccessful and therefore safeguarding the West. Inspired by Steiner's lectures was the enigmatic Karl Heise, who, in 1918, published a classic work of anti-Masonry and anti-Semitism entitled Die Entente Freimaurerei und die Weltkrieg. The book was partly backed by Steiner, who wrote a cagey forward to the first edition. Another occultist active in this discourse on the other side of the Atlantic was Aleister Crowley. Popular historian Tobias Churton has recently attempted to document and reconstruct Crowley's five-year period in the United States, which began in 1914. Crowley and Steiner were connected at this point through mutual Ordo Templi Orientis charters, which had been issued to them by the Freemason and Prussian spy Theodore Royce. During the war, Crowley worked for, or was connected to, several individuals employed by British, U.S., and German intelligence agencies, as well as to many secret societies and Freemasons. The factual extent of this history remains uncertain. What is often suggested about Crowley is that in America he infiltrated the German-sponsored periodicals in New York that aimed at keeping America out of the war. Crowley himself claimed to have written articles that were intended to undermine the German image. A problem with this narrative is that Crowley did not claim this until after the war and with his usual jocularity and two-sided wit. Churton's interlocutor is historian Richard Spence, whose 2008 book, Secret Agent 666, makes a more definitive argument that Crowley was employed by the Directorate of Military Intelligence, Section 5, or MI5, during the war, and even linked Crowley's activities to the sinking of the Lusitania. Spence's key piece of evidence is a U.S. Military Intelligence Division report from September 1918, which states, quote, it was determined that Aleister Crowley was an employee of the British government, but at present in this country on official business of which the British consul, New York City, has full cognizance. It was found that the British government was fully aware of the fact that Crowley was connected with this German propaganda and had received money for writing anti-British articles, end quote. This report does seem to lend credence to Crowley's later statements that he was writing such propaganda in service of the crown. A report from 1917, also originally brought to light by Spence, illustrates the overlapping context of conspiracism, esotericism, and covert intelligence. Spence suggests Crowley's involvement with Royce and the OTO may have been encouraged by someone in Britain's Secret Service in order to gain access to German intelligence. The 1917 report is entitled German Suspects, and it comes from the official Office of Naval Intelligence. In the now declassified report, George Winslow Plummer, an American Freemason and occultist, is said to be the head of the U in the U.S. of a German Rosicrucian secret society whose grandmaster is Rudolf Steiner in Berlin. Amazingly, the report continues, quote, These two men, Plummer and Steiner, claim to be able to communicate with each other without using any cable or telegraph system in public use. Two other men who are mentioned as being connected with the system are Mr. Holden Sampson and Mr. Alistair Crowley. All of these men are 33rd degree Masons." End quote. 
The report mentions that this information is care of McCoy Publishing Company on John Street in New York City, one of the biggest Masonic publishers and ritual supply companies in the U.S., which suggests that the Masons tipped off the authorities. The U.S. Military Intelligence Division's file on Steiner, dated April of 1923, profiles Steiner as a potential secret agent trained for military subterfuge under the guise of a religious leader. Such claims are substantiated using identifiable conspiracism tropes. Quote, Steiner's early training as a Jesuit, when he was probably initiated into occult secrets, of which this body makes a special study, and his friendship with Lenin in Switzerland in 1919, were all preparing him for a career of subtle underground political intrigue, clearly disguised under the cloak of religious illumination which was to make him in future years such a dangerous power to church and state. Unfortunately, his spiritual intuition seems to have developed on baser and more subtle lines and have rendered the man a most dangerous individual. Possibly the parallel drawn by Miss Webster in her book called The World Revolution between the present Russian Revolution and the French Revolution is of interest. About the time of the French Revolution, Weissop formed his mystical society called Les Illuminés, which exoterically promoted religious mysticism on spiritual lines, but esoterically was used for political purposes and revolutionary propaganda, and possibly had some bearing on the course of events in France during the Revolution. End quote. The foregoing presentation has attempted to reveal nationalist tendencies of esotericists in times of crisis. While it is becoming clearer that conspiracism and esotericism are joined at the hip, a third area that is equally joined to the others constitutes the shadowy world of covert intelligence and military operations. These dynamic social processes are as evident today as they were during the First World War. Fiction, politics, and esotericism are coming together to form a fluid blend in which what is real is no longer definable. A parallel example from our time is the early internet blockbuster Loose Change, released between 2005 and 2009, which widely popularized certain conspiracy theories surrounding the attacks of September 11th. The writers of Loose Change started the project as fiction, but during their research and their preparations for making a fictitious film, discovered their story was real, and then started framing their project in terms of a documentary. As with the legend of the Angels of Mons, the story of Loose Change succeeded in combining fact and fiction, galvanizing a world of reinvigorated myth. The Q phenomenon is the perfect example of a new worldview being constructed out of these elements. Known as QAnon, this movement is referred to by its followers as the next great awakening in the U.S. It brings together conspiracy, nationalist politics, esotericism, as well as the covert sphere in the shadowy figure with Q security clearance who gives out clues from behind the veil. And as you can see, the list goes on and on here. One of the things that I didn't get to touch on in this presentation, which I hope to explore more in the future, is this notion that 9-11 was itself a sort of occult ritual act. And again, this is to bring this notion of occult secret societies and warfare, uh, as we have seen in the First World War, up into the present. So <clears throat> the more I have looked into this topic, the more I've thought about how important the 9-11 event was for where we currently are, particularly the, um, the war on terror, so-called war on terror that followed and looking back now, many people have uh, attributed these occult and esoteric symbolisms to that event itself and using a sort of hermeneutics, like an esoteric hermeneutics, to draw out the symbolism that they find encoded in this actual event, which then signifies a kind of larger occult uh, event that took place. And usually that's thought to be something like the renting of the veil between this world and whatever other world <laughs> is out there. So the idea is something like <clears throat> a small scale ritual performed inside a temple is done 
in order to bring down the veil between human beings and mortals and wherever the divine sits or is located. And so in this case, <clears throat> the idea is that 9-11 represented the same uh, operation on a very large scale with, you know, thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of people watching it happen in real time. Um, and that this had the effect of bringing down the veil between the world of the spirit or the world of the divine and the world of mortals sort of in a in a permanent way like the the event of 9-11 which in this particular narrative is seen as an organized ritual uh, an occult ritual that was pulled off by occultists or people who are working in secret probably through networks of secret societies that this orchestrated act brought down the veil for good and this sort of culmination of now the mixing of the world of the mortals and the world of the spirit. So I think that much more work could be done, particularly on looking at 9-11 and how this fits into this larger theme of esotericism, conspiracism, and um, the covert sphere that I have highlighted in this presentation. Thanks for watching.